very uh, and uh, very very briefly. Uh, so uh, we welcome today uh, Monica Hudal. She's a professor of mathematics, biomathematics, and she's going to talk to us about some really interesting uh, work she has been doing uh, about ghost folding gentrification and what are the physical causes of it. So without any further delay, Monica, please the floor is yours. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm I'm just really excited to to be here. I was so glad, um, you know, to meet, um, uh, you know, some people from your group at the conference. It's great to see them again. And um, Claire is a new student of mine, so she's very interested in this project too. So I invited her to to join us. Um, but uh, anyway, let me begin by uh, sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, let's see, put it in view mode. So I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So I don't know. We might have to continue this another another meeting. Um, so I, well, so we don't really to... have any time limits so or any okay limits. So all right, all that's perfect. Great. Yeah. So uh, let me give you a, a little bit of background um, of myself. So um, my training is sort of in mathematical sciences. I'm an applied mathematician, uh, but I've done a lot of statistics and computational modeling and computer science along the way. And I always had an interest in um, uh, biology and, and the brain. So I'm from Canada originally, and that's where I did my undergraduate degree. And then I moved to um, Australia where I did my graduate studies. And then uh, I came to the United States as a postdoc for two years, uh, first at, here at Florida State University, and then a year at Johns Hopkins University. And then I was hired at FSU when we started a biomath graduate program. So we have a PhD program um, in biomathematics as well as an undergraduate program. And uh, for any of you who might be looking uh, for either a graduate um, a program or a postdoctoral um, training, we have uh, postdocs here in the department and we're going to be advertising. Uh, we have a group of eight postdocs and they sort of cycle in and out on a rotational basis for two years and we're going to be hiring three postdocs this year. Um, so Bruno, if anybody in your group's looking for a, a postdoc for next year, um, yeah, I'm please actually have looking apply at, and tell I'm, them they want to work with me. <laughs> I'm looking at a couple of them right now. <laughs> so, so that would be be very exciting. That would be another a great way. So, I've been working on some models of cortical folding pattern development um, for uh, quite a number of years now, and this sort of all started off with work uh, where um, I was with a, a research uh, project where we were sort of looking at. Um, uh, folding patterns and anatomy and function in adults and across various diseases. And after a while, I thought, well, this is a really hard problem because the brain is so variable. So let's start looking at uh, the developing brain. And this turned out to be very, very interesting because when you read the biology, there's no consensus as to why the folding patterns develop. And um, how they are um, modeled um, and where they occur and why they occur. And even the biologists and neurobiologists are in very different camps as to sort of what they believe in. So my research interests sort of fall broadly under the category of characterizing uh, brain shape and brain folding patterns uh, to sort of try to characterize and understand uh, the patterns, how they develop and grow, as well as how do they change in age and in disease. And then, so can diseases be detected by early uh, changes in uh, folding or, and how does that affect anatomy and function? And I'm also interested in discovering perhaps new shape metrics using uh, conformal and topological invariants. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So some of the questions that we can ask are what influences the size, location, and formation of cortical folds during development? Uh, how do folds form? What are the underlying biophysical characteristics that uh, affect cortical folding? Uh, what constitutes normal cortical folding uh, variability and abnormal folding? Um, 
And how can we model uh, folding paths as they develop and grow? So uh, this is a schema schematic of uh, the, the human brain. So um, I think all of you are sort of familiar with this, but this is the adult brain and it varies quite a lot in its folding. Um, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I might talk about um, uh, a re area here, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, um, and I might uh, about uh, some cerebellar uh, data. But as you can see from, uh, this is some data from uh, the brainmuseum.org, which are uh, uh, anatomical uh, brains and the folding patterns in the brain vary dramatically across species. Um, from what we call uh, little to no folding in small species and you know larger folding in the human brain. So of course one of the questions is you know well is high folding associated with intelligence and that's not clear cut as certain a lot of animals exhibit high folding patterns uh, some of which you might uh, classify with high intelligence, such as the dolphin, but there's also a species of zebras and goats um, that have very high uh, folding patterns. So uh, a lot of the data that I deal with uh, comes from uh, MRI data, um, the folding patterns, but today I'm mainly going to talk about some of the uh, phenomenological models that we are uh, developing and trying to correlate with uh, MRI data. So the first model that I'm going to begin with is um, a biochemical model. And so here uh, we're using uh, what's called uh, Turing patterns or Turing pattern formation to help us understand uh, cortical folding. Uh, but this sort of comes out of a series of papers that were published um, in the 90s and 2000s that uh, talked about um, some cells called intermediate progenitor cells that um, are formed during neurogenesis that um, might be linked to cortical folding pattern uh, formation. So uh, we're, I'm going to take you through a number of different steps. We're going to talk about a little bit about cortical development, what Turing systems are, and then how we're modeling this uh, geometrically and mathematically. So in the, in the 1980s, um, uh, the radial unit hypothesis was proposed that talks about a, a founding population of radial glial cells that are created in the ventricular zone. And the radial glial cells um, create replacement cells and neuroblasts that travel to the cortex to create our cortical layers. And then the neurons stock outwardly creating columns, um, creating a one-to-one -one mapping between the cortex and the ventricular zone. However, this kind of model, this model didn't explain cortical folding. So it was expanded in the 2000s um, to talk about this other cell type that's created called intermediate progenitor cells. Um, so initially you have your radial glial cells forming your, your uh, uh, neuroblasts. And then um, at some point, intermediate progenitor cells are created that can also create neuroblasts. So now you have the radial glial cells as well as the IPCs, the intermediate progenitor cells, creating neuroblasts, traveling up uh, the um, uh, column. Uh, and the result is the amplification of the number of neuroblasts that travel to the cortex, uh, which is what is um, seen uh, that, that we have a, often a higher uh, amplification of neurons. But again, this doesn't explain cortical folding. So this was modified or adapted a little bit later, a couple years later, uh, which basically says that, well, we have the same process occurring, but now you're going to get a non-uniform distribution of intermediate progenitor cells uh, resulting in some areas where you have neuron amplification and other areas where you don't. Um, and this is what might is leading to the cortical folds and the cortical va valleys. And the evidence that's been presented from this is some data from some macaque uh, monkey data um, <laughs> where you get a thickening of the, the ventricular zone, uh, which is thought to be where some of these intermediate progenitor cells might be occurring. And then subsequently you get um, um, uh, folding uh, occurring. So what we are um, 
uh, going to use is what's called a growing domain Turing system. So we're going to model the development and the growth of the brain using a Turing reaction diffusion system. So uh, we have an activator, U, and an inhibitor, V. And uh, the, the basic model is you have your uh, diffusion term and your reaction term. And so these are the kinetics. The kinetics produce the activator inhibitor. It diffuses. Um, and uh, so then you get this activator concentration and inhibitor concentration uh, you know, in the brain. And uh, so we have these certain parameters that we're interested in, particularly this omega parameter, which we can consider that to perhaps be a genetic kind of control. So how much uh, activator and inhibitor is being produced. Uh, we can incorporate a growth function. So this is what this row is when we're using uh, exponential growth. And so the basic system is a, a Turing system is a non-growing system, but what we've, uh, what I'm just really mainly going to talk about today, I'm going to show you some preliminary results from the uh, non-growing system. But what we, we did was we modified the models to change it so that we have a growing domain. And when you do that, the math, out of the mathematics, you get this extra term, this minus two RU term and minus two RV term. And you can almost think of that as like a dilution term, right? So as the brain is growing and you have this activator and inhibitor um, being produced as the brain grows, it sort of becomes diluted um, over the cortex. But anyway, let me show you sort of a little bit more um, the, 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 the model. So here we have our uh, activator and here our inhibitor. And so what exactly is a Turing system? Because if you think if you have a reaction diffusion system over time, everything is going to diffuse and you're going to get a nice homogeneous system. Well, to be a Turing system, there's sort of two unique uh, uh, properties. First is you have stability in the absence of diffusion, and then you have uh, diffusion-driven instability. And so usually the reason why this occurs is because of differences in time scale. Um, so sort of an analogy is, um, for example, if you have, let's say, a forest fire uh, burning, right? And then so it's burning, uh, creating patches of burnt forest. And so it's burning really quickly. And so you have a, a helicopter come with some fire retardant. It, it tries to put out the fire, but it doesn't quite have enough. It's very slow. It doesn't really have enough. So the helicopter has to go back and get some fire retardant. And in the meantime, the fire has jumped to create another sort of fire patch. Um, and so by the time the helicopter comes back, you know, the inhibitor is very slow. It, it, it can only put out most of the fire, but not all of it, and it jumps. So in this way, you can get patterns forming. Most common patterns we see are striping patterns and um, spotting patterns. Um, it, this kind of model has been used to model like patterns in fish and in um, butterflies, um, tiger stripes, um, the leopard spots. So we decided to try to apply it to, to the brain uh, and, and the folding pattern formation. And, and uh, so we're using, again, here's our, our diffusion term, our dilution term, and these are our kinetics. And so we're using phenomenological kinetics um, that are known to create these Turing patterns. Um, but anyway, so this is a, um, a, a partial differential equation. Uh, and the solution is in the form of, uh, we can have make it separable in terms of our temporal component and our spatial component. So the temporal component is where we're looking for the conditions for uh, instability conditions. And then we're solving the spatial component, which is um, Helmholtz's equation. So here's sort of an example um, of what can happen. Uh, so here's a simple 1D Turing system. This is a, a, a non-growing system, so a static system. So the simple system is uh, you, you have uh, your uh, Helmholtz's equation here. You can solve it. Um, and if you look at it, right, we want, we can plot um, that this graph here is our U is our activator and X is our spatial term. And so everything is normalized. So our activator and our inhibitor, inhibitor concentrations vary from like minus 
0.5 to plus 0.5. Um, and so we want to look at the conditions where we have um, instability, right? So we want the tempo component, uh, so where the, the real part of the tempo component to be positive. And those are the conditions where we'll have our diffusion-driven instability. So when we look at when those conditions occur, like our k-squared is our parameter, then we can use that. Uh, and so wherever the activator is um, greater than one, so in this part of the curve here, that's where you get pattern forming. So that would be, for example, like a stripe. And wherever you don't have enough inhibitor, so where the activator, I mean, where you, sorry, where you have enough activator, you get the pattern forming. And wherever you don't have enough activator, because the inhibitor is strong, so where it's negative, you have no pattern forming. And so we can use these some of these parameters, for example, like our omega and our r. So that means we have no growth to look at what kind of patterns happen. So if we were to look at, um, so uh, change it, our parameters slightly. So this was the 1D, the case that I just showed you. So where your activator is a positive, that would be like having a pattern forming. So like a stripe and then where it's uh, a no stripe. And so these are, um, this is like a, a boundary conditions, uh, matching boundary conditions, um, periodic boundary conditions on the, on the um, at zero and uh, one here. So now if we change our parameters slightly, you can then change the number of regions where you get um, your activator being positive. So here you would get a stripe forming, no stripe, and then another stripe forming. So you would then get this kind of pattern here. So what we wanna do this is now we wanna do this on something that looks a little bit more brain-like. So we're using um, a prolate spheroid model. So a prolate spheroid is sort of like a football shaped object. It's an ellipse rotated um, about its major axis. Uh, and we've also done some work looking at oblate spheroids, which is like an ellipse rotated about its minor axis. So that's more like a tangerine or flying saucer shaped object. And, and that becomes interesting when you start looking at brain diseases where maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's no um, uh, corpus callosum and ventricles are maybe merged together. But anyway, so we've got our activator and our inhibitor reactants, which we're saying are correspond to our IPC cell production. And so we want to model the shape of the lateral, lateral ventricle. So this sort of region here, uh, and it looks prolate spheroid-like with a major axis uh, corresponding to that major axis of the lateral ventricle. And so the surface of the spheroid would re represent the ventricular zone where neurogenesis occurs. Um, and we want to look at the growth rate and how, so how our exponential growth rate and our genetic expression uh, affect pattern formation. So prolate spheroid co coordinates, um, uh, so they're somewhat like uh, elliptical coordinates, a little bit more uh, complicated, but uh, we have our radial term and an angular term and a rotational term. And we also have this focal distance term here, which sort of helps uh, dictate, you know, the, the uh, eccentricity of our spheroid. Um, so the idea is what I'm going to show you in, in our um, uh, results is so the orange colors are going to correspond to where you have enough activator. So where you have enough activator, that's where you're going to get IPC cells being created during neurogenesis, which will create these extra neurons, which will call create a type of cortical folding. And then where we have uh, a deficit of activator, so a lot of inhibitor, that's where there's going to be no IPCs being created. So we have fewer neurons being created. Um, and so that would lead to um, a, a, a sulcus in the brain. So we have a number of different things we can control in this kind of model, which perhaps could correlate to certain brain diseases. Um, so the two main parameters are our focal distance and this psi value, uh, which is sort of our radial term, or, or sort of related to our radial term. So for example, if you 
change different the focal distance or different psi values, you can sort of see how this affects the shape of what your spheroid looks like. Um, so for the purposes of our simulations, what we did was to be able to compare things. We kept everything, uh, so everything had a constant surface area like that of a, a unit sphere. Um, and that helps us choose what parameters to use for um, some of our, our some of these parameters that are flexible. So we're going to solve Helmholtz's equation in terms of our prolate spheroid coordinates. Um, Another advantage of using prolate spheroid coordinates, um, not only did it look like the um, sort of shape of the cortex perhaps during development, but mathematically, they're a nice choice because it's a separable coordinate system. And so we end up with uh, uh, three uh, ordinary differential equations. Um, and uh, so we wanna try to solve these equations and we can do a couple of interesting things. Um, mathematically because if we're interested in no growth initially with a static domain so that means the derivative of the radial term will be zero because the the radius isn't growing so um it's radially invariant and so we can then just look at uh the remaining part of the equation and what this allows us to do is to solve for this parameter k squared, which uh, if you remember back to those initial slides, it helps us predict cases where we will get pattern forming and when we won't get pattern forming and what kind of patterns will form. So when we talk about um, our prolate spheroid, we can talk, we talk about things in terms of our uh, harmonic, spheroidal harmonic patterns. They're usually characterized by two indices, M and N. Um, so where M is uh, the number of uh, copper or black spots uh, traversing from left to right. So here, right, it's all zero. So when M is zero, you get striping, horizontal striping patterns. And N is uh, your value of M plus the number of shifts from copper to black. So so depending on the values of these different indices, right? So here n is equal to three. So we're getting a shift here. Um, uh, so since m is one, n would be, even though it's it's three, uh, the number of shifts would be two, right? Three minus one. So here we're getting one shift from black to copper and another shift from, from copper to black. And so you can get these different kinds of, of patterns forming um, in these different ways. So if we look at things that um, might be influenced by um, pattern formation, well, we can look at some an evolutionary timeline. So where we can look at uh, the domesticated cat, which is considered to have little to no folding. Uh, then we can think of the lemur, uh, which is a medium amount of folding and humans, which have a, a high amount of folding. And so we use these MN indices to indicate how our um, pattern formation curves may change with respect to um, our focal distance parameter. So we can talk about um, our patterns in terms of uh, sectorial sulci, which we're saying go uh, you know, from uh, the, the frontal part of the brain uh, to uh, the, the back part of the brain. So these would give us our uh, vertical types of stripes. And then we can also talk about transverse sulci. And so when you have your two indices the same, you would get one sectorial sulcus forming. When you have A22, you would get two sectorial sulci. And then we also have um, the transverse sulci um, occurring. Uh, and they would be, for example, A02 indicates one transverse sulcus uh, and A04 would give you two. So we can look at uh, uh, things that might happen across different species. So uh, if we say take a focal distance of three, and so um, this black curve, this is this K squared curve, right? So we can think about what happens as this K squared curve uh, changes sort of like over time and, and the order of uh, what has to happen for things to occur. So as K increases, 
right? First, we're going to intersect an A11 curve and then an A02 curve and then finally an A04 curve, right? So what this is saying is our transverse sulci, right, which is the, um, the, um, these upper sulci will not form until we have the first sectorial sulcus forming. Um, so we have to have a first sectorial sulcus like the A11 forming before we get our other transverse sulci. And if you look at the development of the cat, right, this is what seems to sort of happen in the cat. First, you get uh, these um, uh, sectorial sulci forming in the cat um, before you get other types of sulci forming. So if we increase the focal distance, um, so that's like thinking of increasing, uh, you know, the brain size. Well, this changes the order in which these sectorial sulci are developed over time. Over, um, so first we have, in this case, now an A02 curve forming, a then A11 followed by an A04. So this is sort of, this is saying that we get one transverse sulci, the A02 curve forming before the first sectorial sulci. And this seems to be what happens in some species of uh, lemurs, that uh, first we get the um, transverse sulcus forming before we get the sectorial sulci forming. And then if you further increase the focal distance, which perhaps, you know, which we're, we're uh, you know, correlating to humans, again, the order of the curves change. So now you're going to get your two transverse um, sulci forming before your uh, sectorial sulci. And again, in humans, this seems to be what happens um, in that you get, you know, the uh, sulci um, here, like this is sort of like the uh, central sulcus and the calcrine sulcus forming before you get some of the other sulci forming. And this is sort of really important, right? Because if you think of this in terms of evolutionary timelines, uh, when lateral ventricle focal distance are smaller, uh, especially like in the, the, the lemur, um, uh, in the old order uh, species of, of the suborders of the lemur, they don't have a central sulcus forming. But in more recent species along the evolutionary timeline, they do have a central sulcus forming. Um, so later when the focal distance are larger, we get a second transverse sulcus appearing, which seems to uh, correspond to the central sulcus in, in higher order uh, primates. So we can now expand this to think about, well, let's th think about this in terms of a growing domain. So now we're going to incorporate uh, exponential growth, and this allows the domain size to be controlled, um, leading to more complex patterns. And again, we have uh, two different uh, patterns. We have uh, our omega pattern, which is sort of like the overall level of genetic control, and then the R, which is the growth rate pattern. Um, so you can sort of see the effect of sort of some of these different patterns have on the, the type of uh, um, distribution of how these, uh, the activator and the inhibitor. So for example, when the genetic control is um, the same and your R uh, increases, right? You get much more complex patterns forming, right? And then if you uh, were to keep R the same, but um, have maybe your genetic control of less kinetics, um, of the uh, of the activator and the inhibitor, you can get other kinds of patterns forming. So we this you know exponential growth is nice. So what we did was we took a data from a paper that was published that showed uh, sort of how um, uh, so, some different regions of the brain grow over time, and we modeled that uh, as a logistic function. So. Uh, we can have, you know, the growth stabilizing. And so this is just a time period snapshot. So in all of these um, models, we begin with a random distribution of activator and inhibitor along the equator. And then over time, as it grows, so you can see here in these different, it, it's growing in size, dynamically growing, and you can see the activator and inhibitor diffuses 
uh, over the surface of the model over time as well. So each of these red dots uh, corresponds oops, to uh, one of these different time points. Um, so we can look at perhaps applications to um, some different diseases. Um, one disease is uh, polymicrogyria, uh, meaning many small gyri. Um, so uh, polymicrogyrias are often associated with malformations uh, in a particular gene, which is known to regulate cortical patterning. Um, and so if you think of polymicrogyria, it's associated with a uh, lot, lot of lateral ventricle enlargement, which we can model by uh, increasing our R value. Um, so, uh, and the other disease we're going to look at uh, to sort of correlate results to is the Norman Roberts syndrome. Uh, so this is a type of lysencephaly where we have a below number of cortical folds. And um, in this case, um, uh, it, they're known, it's microcephaly is known for a smaller than normal brain size. So we can model this by decreasing or slowing down uh, the growth rate. So these are um, two animations. Uh, so we just pick some values uh, just to sort of, you know, consider uh, as a sort of, uh, you know, our base simulation. And then in this one, if we increase our radius, right, uh, our R value, and to see what happens. So what you're going to see in these pictures, this uh, figure here shows the rate of growth. Um, and then you're gonna see this growing over time. And uh, this is the, the magnitude of the activator and, and inhibitor concentration. So again, with where you have dark is activator, I mean, inhibitor and light is um, activator. So, uh, over time, so here it starts off with very little change, and now it's going to grow more rapidly. You can see the activator and inhibitor diffusing over the surface and the pattern evolving, and then eventually it's going to stable off as um, the logistic growth model. And then what we did was we used the magnitude of the concentration as an indicator of perhaps the cortical folding uh, model in depth. Um, and so this one, uh, again, is same sort of thing, but uses different uh, or different R values. So it's not, it's gonna grow uh, more quickly. And uh, again, um, as it grows, you, it's going to stabilize, stabilize, and then you're going to get sort of different kinds of um, uh, patterns. And then we're going to use that. So we get sort of higher degrees of, uh, of folding. So um, just sort of to take a snapshot. So if you look at, for example, a low R value, um, uh, sort of a, a standard R value, and then a higher R value, you can see how it can, it, it, you know, can really change the, the folding pattern uh, formation over time. Uh, and so uh, if you want to think of um, another application, right, so it, this is just sort of summarizing the, the results. So if you wanted to look at, say, Norman Roberts syndrome uh, with microcephaly, right, if we want an enlarged lateral ventricle, but with a small head size, we're going to keep R the same, but perhaps change the genetic control of how things, uh, you know, the kinetics that occur initially. Um, and then uh, say this one here, another way of thinking of it with microcephaly, where you have enlarged ventricles, perhaps the growth rate is the same, but your gen genetic control of your ventricles um, is uh, affected differently by increasing um, the omega value. Um, so the other type of model um, that we're interested in is one of the other theories for um, cortical Actually, maybe before I continue with this, are, are were there any questions about um, any of that so far? I know it's a lot yeah. of. <laughs> I have a lot of questions and comments, but I think it's possibly best to leave them for the, to the end. Otherwise, you can get completely derailed by the discussion. Okay, okay. all right. Um, so then, uh, another model that we are looking at that we're interested in is uh, more sort of the axonal tension type model. Um, so this is another one of the models that have has been proposed. Um, 
that, uh, you know, that axonal tension might be driving uh, some of the pattern formation. Um, so what we decided to look at this, and instead of um, using these uh, chemical, this Turing pattern model as like activators and inhibitors, we wanted to look at, well, what if it's perhaps uh, more, think of it more in terms of a mechanically based type model. Um, so in this case, what we want to do, um, so we have a, a 2D model here. Um, and the idea is that we're going to have uh, applied different forces, different axonal, different forces, which correspond to axonal tension to see how that might affect cortical folding. And so we're interested in the direction of the forces um, and, and the magnitude of the forces. So uh, we're doing this with um, a, a finite element method. Uh, we're using a stress strain uh, elasticity model. So we've created all of these. Uh, 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 we're just modeling the, um, I guess, essentially the, the gray matter of the cortex. So where the inner curve is the, uh, the boundary of the white matter, gray matter, and the outer is the gray matter, cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, what we're doing is we're anchoring boundary conditions, the, the fixed point, the points on uh, the, the end of the sphere model. And so what we want to do is see what happens um, as we apply different forces to um, uh, different areas. And this is sort of related to um, looking at uh, the uh, intermediate progenitor self. Um, self amplification and relating that to axonal tension right so when we have uh the, these neuron uh these columnar structures between the the ventricular zone the lateral ventricular zone and the cortical plate right so we have um all of the you can also think of it as sort of axons being you know trying to maintain certain connections and uh, connecting between the ventricular zone and, and the cortical plate. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to sort of take some of the results we had from uh, the Turing kind of system and think of this more in terms of axonal tension. So uh, again, we have um, uh, our Turing pattern here. And so what we wanna do is we wanna think of the, the magnitude um, or, you know, the the, area under the curve of the Turing pattern is corresponding to uh, something related to axonal tension. So what we're doing is we're, we want to apply these forces um, to, to this uh, semicircular model. And so um, when we apply these, right, we can change the, um, the orientation and we can also change the magnitude. So they're going to play a role in terms of what sort of cortical patterns that we can um, develop. And so we're looking at this in terms of tension. And so we're, again, this is sort of an engineering type model coming from you know um, elasticity and um, a finite element method. So I'm not really gonna go into the numerics of what we're doing uh, in the finite element method. Um, uh, or the elasticity, but more just sort of focus on the results, right? So we can generate these different types of Turing patterns. Um, so again, if you think of that 1D Turing pattern formation, right, depending upon the parameters in our model, we can sort of indicate areas where we have, uh, you know, lots of uh, patterns happening, um, and fewer patterns happening. So in this case, this would correspond to perhaps more axonal tension uh, influencing the model, or, or sorry, fewer axonal tension um, forces influencing cortical folding pattern or more axonal tensions. And so we're using some of the biophysical parameters that we've found in the literature regarding brain elasticity and brain size. And we wanna see what happens when we, um, influence. And so we wanted to look at a couple of the different values coming from the, the brain literature uh, to be able to compare results. So one of the things we looked at was uh, gyrification index, 
which is the length of you know the complete contour, um, the actual contour of the brain versus the, the outer contour to get some sort of measures that might be to see how comparable they were um, to uh, the literature. So, uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is if we affect uh, in terms of this uh, model, we are going to uh, apply different forces um, and then see what happens as the brain grows uh, in terms of um, the uh, jarification index. So here where these little divots are here, I you didn't draw the axons, but we this is the idea is we're gonna have some axonal tension forces uh, being applied here in different regions. And then we're going to grow over time uh, to see what happens. And as you can see then that as a, the brain size either grows or if you wanna compare smaller brains versus bigger brains, right? Uh, you're going to have deeper um, sulci in, in the larger brains. Um, we can also alter the strength of the axonal tension forces. Um, so as uh, again, this is sort of coming from the, the Turing patterns, right? As the wave number decreases, the uh, forces, the distances between the pulling forces will become wider. And um, this will increases the rate of the, the gyrification index. And we will, I'll sort of, sh I'll show some pictures here, but we can sort of see, interpret this in terms of species with uh, bigger cortices will tend to have a relatively higher convoluted surface. So, uh, such as like the zebra and um, or humans and species with um, smaller cortices will have uh, fewer convolutions in their cortex. Um, we can also uh, we also looked at the effect as to what happens um, if we apply these axonal tension forces uh, and we change um, the thickness of the um, the the gray matter. So here we can see, here we've got like a two millimeter cortex increasing in, in size to a 4.5 millimeter. Um, so when we change the cortical thickness, um, the gyrification index uh, decreases exponentially. So resulting in sort of a, a flatter sort of cortex overall. Um, uh, so this is just uh, just sort of summarizing the results when we have the brain size. Uh, if we look at um, overall the brain size and the gyrification index. Um, so as the ratio of the radius over the thickness decreases, the gyrification index also increases. So you can sort of manipulate these different parameters to sort of see which ones influence uh, folding in different ways. Uh, and also then we can affect, change, look at the directions of the axonal tension forces um, uh, and seeing what sort of influence that has on folding. So here are some examples where, so um, in the previous results, right, we always had uh, axonal tension forces uh, perpendicular uh, to the cortical surface. Um, you know, representing the normal direction. But um, if you have your axonal tension forces occurring in different directions, you can create some very interesting kind of um, folding patterns or interesting convolutions, right? So the, um, the and these also then influence the gyrification index. So of course, the, um, the number of forces and the direction of forces um, all, uh, well, this is sort of showing the direction of forces, how that affects the cortical folding. So you can get sort of really, uh, um, you know, broad, wide folds or um, deeper folds as the, um, uh, as the, the tension forces become more, um, more normally oriented. Um, and uh, again, here are just sort of some different, uh, uh, also changing the directions of changing the applied forces and looking at how that uh, overall affects the, the gyrification index. Um, and so we just sort of, some of these results here, just um, sort of summarize 
what happens when we change uh, the, the wave form, the wave number, which is sort of indicative of sort of how many forces you might have and how that might influence the, the gyrification index. Uh, and then the other parameter that we can affect is the magnitude, right, of the axonal tension force. So this is controlled by the uh, this sort of um, parameter we have that allows you to sort of affect the overall um, magnitude of the force. And again, you can see, um, depending, we can create very different interesting kind of folding patterns um, depending upon uh, you know, the strength of the force and um, the direction that it's applied in. Um, and then just a couple other things I wanted just to touch upon very briefly is just some of the other work that I've done in some other areas called conformal mapping. Um, so this isn't so much, this isn't directly related to cortical folding, but um, it, it does, I'm very interested in it, how it might apply. Um, and can be used. And this is sort of an exploratory uh, type of thing. So um, conformal mapping is a map, uh, for those who don't know, that preserves angles and angle direction, right? And so uh, we're in many ways very familiar with uh, conformal maps indirectly, but essentially they're indicated by a grid where you have perpendicular lines and then in the corresponding after you apply the conformal mapping you have uh you still have those perpendicular angles so all the angles are preserved um but you might be distorting uh space and um uh so you know you're not in an area uh, length and area um and so one of the things that um i've worked on previously is we've presented a method for flat mapping or unfolding the brain using conformal mapping techniques. Uh -huh. um, I know you're probably all familiar with like the free surfer flat map type techniques um, and that. And um, so coming from mathematics, I'm kind of an advocate of conformal mapping because one of the advantages of conformal mapping is that um, it's mathematically unique, right? Whereas like the free surfer techniques, they have all these different parameters you can change and affect. Um, and, you know, you can get different maps and they're very difficult to compare. So, and one of the advantages of, another advantage of conformal mapping is you can work in different geometries. We can work in the Euclidean plane uh, and we can work uh, in the uh, unit disk. Um, or the conformal plane, and we can work on the sphere. Um, and uh, the re again, why conformal is interesting is because it's impossible to flatten the surface with intrinsic curvature without introducing metric or aerial distortions. But we know we can preserve angles, right? And this is often known as the map makers problem, um, right? Where sailors knew you could navigate with longitude and latitude. Um, and so there are, uh, you can always preserve angles. So if you think, well, if we're taking a, a surface that's embedded in three space and want to flatten it, how can we possibly do that? Um, and so when we're going from a discrete setting of something embedded in 3D and we want to flatten it, we want to look at angle proportion. So we want to preserve the same <laughs> angle proportions that are occurring in 3D and just scale them so that they're in the same proportion, but um, in uh, have an angle sum of you know two pi. And so we use this technique called um, circle packing. So conformal maps up until the were very, very difficult to produce unless you had very simple surfaces, um, but they are very well used in like engineering and airfoil design and that. Um, and in the late 80s and early 90s, there were some developments in mathematics that uh, using this technique called circle packing, uh, which when if you compute, compute the circle packing of something, then what gets carried along with it is its conformal map. So we now have an easier way of computing conformal maps mathematically than we did before. A circle packing is simply a configuration of circles with a specified pattern of tangency. So in this case, they're all tangent. Um, and there's various mathematical developments that say that a circle packing can uh, approximate a conformal mapping. 
So what we do is we take the surface, uh, so such as a, a mesh of the, representing the brain. And what we wanna do is wherever at every vertex, we wanna place a circle uh, with that vertex at the center of the circle. And then we wanna impose the condition that if two vertices um, uh, form an edge in your mesh, then those circles must be tangent to each other. And then we also in, in, impose a orientation constraint and we have a boundary condition. Uh, so one way of taking the boundary condition, if you have a surface, is this is the outer, this would be the actual 3D, the length of the surface embedded in space. And then we want to compute the radii of all the circles in the interior. And it's a really sort of simple idea. Um, the idea is that if you have positive curvature or a cone point, the, the sum around the angle of a vertex is, is less than 360 degrees. So you have a deficit of angle. So you want to decrease the radius of the circle in the center to make everything flat. And if you have negative curvature or a saddle point, your angle sum, you have too much, your circles will overlap. So you want to increase uh, the radius of the circle in the center. Uh, you essentially use the inverse cosine law to solve for all the radii, and um, it's a very fast algorithm. Um, it allows us to compute uh, circle packings in, uh, in the Euclidean plane and uh, the hyperbolic geometry, which is like a conformal map. Um, the spherical is a little bit harder, but we can still do it. Um, and then you can get these uh, really um, interesting flat maps. So these are color coded according to mean curvature. Um, so these are, uh, um, so the dark ridges are the sol side, the, the really bright light ones are the, um, uh, um, the gyri. And so here we cut out, uh, you know, the corpus uh, callosum here are the vent, rather the ventricles. And so this is the Euclidean map. This would be a sphere. And this is the hyperbolic disc. Um, and this is always going to be disc shaped, always circular shaped. Um, so we can do, you know, some just fun computational type techniques um, where we can map all the circles and unfold uh, and, and flatten the brain to help get orientation of where things are located. Um, but the thing where this is really interesting, say, I think compared to something like a free surfer map is we don't just have to work with boundary conditions. We can work with other shapes that might be of interest. So, um, and there are certain things that are called conformal invariants. Um, so if we take, well, um, so if you take a rectangle and you look at the aspect ratio of the, the, width to the height of the rectangle, that's a conformal invariant. So the only way you can conformally think two things are conformally equivalent is that that aspect ratio is the same. So uh, I have uh, um, some interesting data. So this was from a group um, um, at Washington University School of Medicine. They were uh, initially interested in this. They have, um, uh, they're interested in the ventral, me ventral medial prefrontal cortex. They have, uh, it's a highly convoluted region. So they were just interested in some visualization techniques of just sort of unfolding and flattening and labeling. But they then wanted to use this to sort of identify a little bit better the ventral, me ventral medial prefrontal cortex and look at this in um, twins. So here we have that ventral medial prefrontal cortex region. If we do this circle packing map, you get the Euclidean map, which is interesting, but it's, you know, it's really more for visualization. But in this case, we can pick four boundary points, one, two, three, four, and map it to a rectangle now. And this is also a conformal mapping. So then what we can do is look at the aspect ratio of the height of the width to the length, and that's this conformal invariant. So what I think would be very interesting is looking to see if perhaps this conformal invariant uh, is similar, say, between twins and non-twins, or perhaps there's some species connection between conformal invariants um, or uh, something, something you know, along those lines. The other thing you, know, you can do is you can do 
other the, and this is sort of a really high you know hypothetical idea is but you can start doing conformal invariance in all sorts of different ways right so let's say you had some functional regions or some a tumor or something like that and if you wanted to uh you could map it to this uh disc shape but then if you sort of for lack of a better word cut out this region um, and you can look at the ratio of this would produce a circle, so you get an annulus. And the logarithm of the inner radius of the annulus to the outer radius is also a conformal invariant. So now you can start doing this with multiple regions. And so now you could start creating sets of numbers for, you know, of conformal invariants for different species or different for different features that you might be interested in. Another thing we can also do with conformal invariance, um, we don't have a, a picture of this, is but you can also do things like where if you bring in more geometric information, your circles do not have to be tangent to each other. You can also create circle packings where you have disjoint circles and overlapping circles. And those are based on a measure called um, hyperbolic uh, distance. And so this is working in hyperbolic geometry. And if you measure the hyperbolic distance, so when two circles are tangent to each other, the hyperbolic distance is one. Um, but if the hyperbolic distance is greater than one, which you could perhaps, uh, you can compute on surfaces uh, between different points, then you would have overlapping circles. And if you have um, hyperbolic distances less than one, um, or sorry, greater than one is disjoint circles and less than one is um, overlapping circles. And so you can do some interesting things with that. So anyway, uh, conformal maps have been used in a variety of places and a ver variety of studies. Um, one other area which is really interesting, which is kind of not related to flat mapping, but the retina topic mapping of the visual cortex is almost a perfect conformal map. Um, uh, so, um, you know, there's all sorts of different things here, but one thing I think too, in terms of these cortical and axonal tension models, uh, and these, uh, you know, IPC Turing models, it would be very interesting is to bring in more realistic geometry, perhaps from, you know, young, uh, MRI data, fetal MRI data, uh, to gain, you know, better estimates for some of these parameters, um, I know, I think it was Victor showed me some uh, cerebellum data where it would maybe be interesting to see if we can replicate, think of this as like an inverse problem to see if we can actually generate these kind of folding patterns that are actually seen um, from, you know, histological slices um, and uh, different things like that. Um, so just to sort of summarize, growing domain Turing models in investigate chemical morphogenesis, <laughs> uh, the axonal tension models bring in more physical characteristics. Another type of model for cortical folding that has been proposed, which I haven't really seen too many anyone really look at implementing, is a differential growth rate hypothesis that differential different tissue types growing at different rates can lead to buckling. Um, so looking at all of these different parameters and how they influence, um, I think, folding uh, and dis different diseases are uh, very important. Um, and so we can use things like conformal invariants, different domains. Um, th there's really no ideas of the kinetic parameters that might influence some of these things. So there's sort of a whole host of different things that could be uh, looked at. And uh, some of this is work of with my former students, uh, Deborah Striegel, uh, Greg Toole, and Sarah Kim. And uh, and I think that's where I'll stop. Okay, so Monica, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. It was really a two the force. It's really impressive how much work you managed to do and how many different directions you managed to explore this problem. So I have like a bunch of pages filled with notes and ideas <laughs> and comments. I very much doubt we're gonna be able to go over all of them today, but I'd like to at least try to get some highlights of some of the things that occurred to me as we were talking, and then we can see if other people have other comments and questions and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, I'll, I'll separate my comments in the same sessions you did. So I'll start with uh, the diffusion uh, uh, reaction patterning, then the uh, uh, court, uh, the axonal tension, and then the conformal mapping. So uh, just to very quickly talk a little bit about how our works connect, we're also very interested in some of the same questions that you are. Uh, uh, we're interested in models of cortical verification, what generates cortical verification. Our models are statistical physics models that incorporate both uh, axonal uh, elongation mechanics, but also the self-avoidance of the cortical surface, which is something I'm going to go back to in a moment. And another thing that we're very, very much interested in, that's something that arose naturally from these initial interest in the models, is better ways of characterizing drified surfaces to determine, say, which surfaces can correspond to courses, which cannot correspond to courses, and how you can quantify the verification so you can tell what's a healthy and unhealthy cortical verification, uh, what are the universal features of cortical verification across species and individuals, and how you can test models for cortical verification using uh, 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 these universes. So uh, when I look at your um, reaction diffusion models, uh, uh, one thing that occurs to me is that they are not really uh, 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 op opposite to, to uh, actual elongation models, but rather complementary, because one thing that we can clearly see from data is that cost verification is a process that's ongoing, and it happens during uh, development. It also occurs during uh, aging, and we know that uh, uh, and neuronal proliferation happens on a certain stage that ends before cortical verification does, as well as axonal growth also happens during this verification phase. So in some sense, a real the, the tail model must incorporate uh, elements of both uh, uh, axonal growth and, uh, and neuronal proliferation. So what do you want to ask you about is in your reaction diffusion models, do you incorporate any role for self-avoidance, the fact that if you have this growing surface, at one point it's going to impinge on itself so that it's going to constrain the sort of shapes you can attain without interpenetrating. Right. Yes, that, that's a, a, a very good question. Um, the short answer is no, not yet. <laughs> okay. That's Part of the, even same with the axonal tension model, one of the reasons we had to work very hard, even in that 2D model, uh, to not have uh, self-intersection. Um, with the, um, so, so back to the sort of with the Turing model, right? So what, what that is, is that's the activator and inhibitor concentration on the surface, right? And so we were using that as um, so with Turing models, really what you have is you have the pre-patterning phase and then the pattern. And so really the, these uh, activator and inhibitor are the pre-pattern, right? So they're saying sort of where the pattern could occur. So in some sense, the idea of self-intersection is non-existent there because that's really okay. the pre-pattern, right? So mm -hmm. then when we generated the, the actual sort of 3D based on model or effect of the folds based on the chemical, uh, what we had to, what we did. So there was nothing in terms of the mathematics because that was the pre-pattern, but we scaled um, the, the concentration so that we had them go, go deep as in gyri, there was no self intersection. But in terms of the physiology of the model, there isn't right now nothing specifically for self-avoidance or self-intersection. Okay, because uh, in our work, uh, I mean, when I start to model these things, I actually thought about using techniques from transfer geometry because I'm originally a cosmologist. So when talking about conformal mapping, I was thinking about, okay, conformal mapping of the Robertson uh, Walker metric. And I thought, right. I know about, okay. So I, I quickly realized that it was very hard to do because there is no way using, say, a local uh, 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 geometry model, such as one that uses differential geometry, uh, 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 to model something that's intrinsic and non-local as self-avoidance. So what I did instead was create a model of statistical physics. So I generate, I did define an entropy that's associated with the name, the number of configurations that uh, uh, 
that are forbidden by self-avoidance. So if you start to uh, uh, have a too compact surface, the number of these configurations that are forbidden grows very fast. And in the end, you have a very low entropy surface, even if it's very mm -hmm. compressed. So uh, I made this analogy with the, uh, the, the sheet of paper, the idea that a sheet of paper, it gets crumpled. And then eventually there is an opposing force to the crumpling force. And that's essentially an entropic force arising from the self-avoidance. Now, one thing that occurred to me while looking at your results and some others is that the uh, reaction diffusion patterning is something very much akin to when you crumple a piece of paper and then you uncrumple it again. And if you crumple it at one more time, you see that the creases that have been generated by your previous crumpling largely guide the uh, crumpling yeah. on the second time. So they coincide. And that uh, uh, may be a way of combining those two reasonings so that you have this pre-patterning that determines the stereotypicity of course, which verification we know exists and it's not incorporated by our models. Uh, and then there's also this entropic effect of forbidden configurations that help guide the process throughout its, uh, uh, its end, including uh, axonal tension and what's not. So that's yeah. something I really see as a point of contact. Yeah. Another question about the reaction diffusion, is there any role for the cortical thickness there? Or can it be incorporated? Yes. Um, so we haven't done that, but yes, I think um, I think what would be really interesting, say, to do with that would be to try to do a similar sort of double hull model. Um, uh -huh. uh, like so we have well haven't done that but that's a really good idea so you could do a double hull model like you we'd say do with the axonal tension and then uh yeah you so then you you could either have some sort of force that sort of binds them together or but that's yeah really i think i think you could do it i but uh, yeah i think that's a really cool idea yeah, because I mean, it, I think it's a parallel process, the buckling process yeah. on one hand, and then the thickening of the cortex as the uh, uh, as the uh, neurons yeah. migrate radially and form the cortical yeah. uh, the cortex. So, uh, uh, so I was thinking about the biological underpinnings of this model, and you you talk about the intermediate progenitor cells. Uh, so presumably, uh, I mean, we know that there's some pre pattern genetic pre pattern if you look at Victor Borel's work, uh, where mm -hmm. the cells are expressed. But also, we know that there are many different pathways to neuroproliferation. So I was wondering if you have, say, a model that incorporates both the intermediate progenitor cells and the outer radial glia, both existing in the subventricular zone, uh, perhaps you may have a, uh, instead of just one omega, we can have like a multiple omegas. Yeah. for different types and can that perhaps incorporate some other co some extra complexity in this cortical pattern uh, pattern and is that something that can be easily incorporated into your model um i don't know if easily <laughs> okay but i think yeah, i think that would be a really i think that is something that would be really worthwhile per pursuing um uh -huh. i think we'd have to think of how you would um you know like I, I, I guess first of all, how you would have create what omega values you would choose for the different different areas or the different lengths, but uh -huh. also, but I think yeah, having you know having the radial glial cells tied between the two, you know, I would I would think you would do it because it's just a mesh, right? You could do it between uh -huh. the different vertices of the mesh it would be a sort of a radial glial column. Um, right and and do that and then i think so so then here would be an interesting question right so what would you you could even look at things like well could you get a different kind of pre-pattern on the the inner hall versus the outer hall right uh -huh. and what would that mean um in terms of cortical geometry or would they always be linked and have the same pre-patterning um based right. on these different um, yeah, there, there, there are some. Yeah, there's some issues with uh, new proliferation. One of them is that you need some sort of back, um, back regulation. Otherwise, it becomes very unstable. Since we have instances mm -hmm. of uh, exponential growth in number of neurons, so we need some sort of. Uh, 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 so there is an animal behind Claire, 
uh, so uh, we need some sort of back reaction. I don't know how to implement, implement that. Uh, so uh, in fact, there's a paper that came out recently about the role of astrocytes in cold eutrophication. So astrogenesis uh, can regulate cold formation in ferrets and it, it's causal. So if you knock out astrogenesis, you knock out eutrophication. So uh -huh. I don't know if, you have, if you're familiar with this paper, but it, that's an extra layer of complication, not only with, yeah. the, with neurogenesis here, but also astrogenesis. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll leave it, uh, uh, the reaction diffusion model aside for a moment because otherwise I'll be talking here for hours, but I think <laughs> that's something we should touch upon later on. So let me move on to the uh, axonal elongation models we've discussed. Uh -huh. uh, there are two main issues here. One is that we have some very similar work done uh, about uh, two-dimensional folding of a ribbon with a mm -hmm. finite thickness. Uh, and it's interesting because we took a different approach. It took the statistical physics approach. Uh, so what we have done was uh, to generate, uh, say, such, a, such, such, such an object and associate uh, each configuration to a certain energy. And this energy has a term associated with the, with the area of the white matter. So the smaller the white matter, the smaller the energy is. Like it's trying to contract, I like the axons. Uh, and also another term associated with the, uh, the curvature of the, uh, the gray matter. And then we evolved this through a Monte Carlo process so that we can sample the uh, ensemble of potential configurations while enforcing self-avoidance. So when mm -hmm. you do that, the surface starts to fold and we find a power law, a relationship between the uh, thickness, the uh, area, and the perimeter of these uh, surface that's both very strict in terms of its exponent, and also one that directly is predicted by our model, which is really cool. Yeah. And then you look at the cerebral data from actually tracing the uh, sagittal midsection of cerebella, and you find this power law that's also very nice and very precise, but has a very different exponent. So yeah. unlike the cortex, it seems that our model can generate gerification, but not the gerification that actually occurs in the cerebellum. So that's something I would love to compare those two sets of yeah. models. Yeah. And Okay. Uh, so the first thing I would like to see is whether your model generates scaling uh, similar to one we have found, and perhaps whether that scaling is more similar to the one found in biology than ours, and incidentally, whether the angle of incidence of the axons that you have more than we have not may affect this slope, which would be really cool. And my second... I, I, think, I think it would. I think they would affect the slope. But, okay. but my, my initial thought would be yes, they would affect the slope. Okay. Uh, so I have just one quick question about this. So you said this is a model about axonal uh, attention, but uh, if I understand correctly, you have tension along the radial glia, right? Yes. Yeah. So so it's not really an axonal tension. It's a radial glia tension model. Yeah. Yeah. Radial glia tension would be a better, probably a better yeah. way of saying. But could we, uh, could you perhaps incorporate uh, axonal tension at a later date? So instead of connecting the ventricular zone to the uh, co to the cortical plate, to connect the cortical plate to itself to various pathways, could that be done using a framework? Yes, yeah, for sure. I think that would be done. Could be done. Cool. I mean, in in some ways, you could think of that. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I think that could be done with the framework. I think you would perhaps need, uh, I, I have to think about it, but yeah, I think you, you could do that by having something that would like indicate, you know, you would need some way of indicating which, you know, from which part of the cortical plate the the tension would go to. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, that, that would be really cool. Uh, and um because one thing that we never thought about, I mean, incorporating our model is really this um, radial glia tension, but it may be an actual uh, factor during this pre-patterning phase. So that's something that we really should mm -hmm. look into. Mm -hmm. um, my second but, question about, oh, oh wait, uh, go. Okay. No, no, I thought that you would move forward to the conformal mapping. 
yeah, yeah. I know you're salivating about that as well. No, I am. I am. Uh, so uh, one last thing about the um, the model of the uh, external elongation. Uh, so I was thinking about ways of incorporating both surface terms and volumetric terms such as axon elongation. And have you ever thought about incorporating something like a uh, like young Laplace equation relating, say, the surface tension to the uh, 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 to the pressure differential in a membrane? Is that something that can be compared to your model or used into a model? I'm not sure. Because your model has shear forces that this would not, but it may be something interesting to look into. Yeah, I I don't know if that could be. Um, yeah, I, I would, because first of all, we're only doing this on a. So first of all, we just did it on the the hemisphere, right? Uh -huh. So I guess you'd have to look at perhaps doing it on. Well, I guess you don't necessarily need a closed sphere. You could just hypothesize you have a closed sphere to do some sort of volumetric or or pressure yeah. uh, constraint. But um, yeah, that one's a little bit harder to think about. Okay, um, that's something you can table for later. Cool. Yeah. So finally, let's move on to conformal mapping. Uh, one thing that I would like to ask you. Yes, go. Just, uh, before the conformal mapping, I have one question about the go ahead the model uh how how much uncertainty uh, do we have about the stresses on your model the stresses and the shear stress yeah well i mean what we took whatever you know there's not i mean i guess yeah in terms of the actual biophysical properties or measurements i mean it's it's really sort of phenomenological, right? In the sense that we're taking the, these ideas from the the Turing pattern uh, ideas and using that as input in terms of the the as the ax, the the forces of the, the direction and the magnitude. It's really sort of the magnitude of the force, and we're using that magnitude, and then as we affect the direction, sort of. Um, uh, altering the direction based to, on maintaining the, the same sort of magnitude to sort of see what role that has. Um, so in terms of, you know, we took whatever biophysical measurements we could, like the, the cortical thickness, um, you know, um, some of the, uh, like the um, Poisson's value and some of the other constants that we could from the literature, but, I don't know how much people really know how accurate those are. Yeah, because uh, I, was, I was thinking about uh, yeah. do the same thing, impose a, I don't know, a stable equilibrium, and then take our our images and try to take this value from the data somehow. I don't mm -hmm. know if you think it this is possible. Because... Uh, when you impose a stable equilibrium, you can get the form of the what what, what shape the cerebellum could have. Apply the the operators, and then we will have some somehow a constraint on the stresses. But I, I don't know if you think it's that possible or not. Well, I, what I was thinking is maybe what you could do is uh, try to do it as an inverse problem, right? So take the model that we have, right? So take, say, you know, the shape of the folds that you have, like, say, from the cerebellum, and then try to do an inverse parameter, uh, inverse problem, and find out what, figure out what parameters, like what forces, what direction, and what their magnitude would need to be to generate something similar. Um, and I don't know if, if that would, so it's not, and I guess as part of that, one of the parameters could be some of these biophysical properties to see. I mean, one of the things we didn't do in any of these models is if we change some of these values, like other than the, the, the simple ones, like, um, you know, 
the radius, the the thick, the cortical thickness, and that you know we changed those, but we didn't really change many of the other parameters. So I don't know what effect those would have on some of the folding patterns as well. Um, so there's all sorts of things you could try to do as a constrained inverse problem to figure out which ones might which you know the number of forces, the magnitude, their direction might generate something similar as what you get from a slice from a histological slice or image. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll just move on to the conformal mapping and then we can open up to other people to also have their comments and questions. So one first quick question, are, are, are you familiar with uh, John Cass uh, road queue preparation? No. It's almost self-explanatory. It's a literal way of looking at a cortex. And I mean, that's, how they call it, so it's not something I came up with. Uh, and they open it like you uh, butterfly uh, Lego lamp, mm -hmm. so that it becomes flat. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and they have these maps of these flattened courses where they can map various scalars on it, such as uh, cortical thickness or neural density. I was just wondering if perhaps that's something you can use as uh, 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 when when you said you can make a conformal map into any uh, 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 flat surface. Perhaps you can use that as your end. Uh, 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 end surface, so you can see how this thing maps. Uh, sure, sure, cultures. yeah. All, all you really need is a, a polyg polygon shape, right? So if it's you know the angle, like so, if it's a consistent, is it a consistent shape always? Is it the exact uh -huh. same shape? So yeah, all, all we would either need would be the like to be the exact same shape is sort of the angle measurements between you know, different, uh, different vertices, I guess, you know, to, to create uh, some sort of polygon type shape, and that would be your boundary condition. And then you can use that, sure, as your, right. your shape that you could, as your basics for conformal map. Cool. And one um, quick question, uh, is this conformal mapping, is it similar or comparable to a Ricci flow? Or they're completely different processes. No, no. Um, yeah, the way the way we're generating these maps is very is a different approach than a Ricci flow, but it's but the the result should be the same as what you get from a Ricci flow because it is a conformal map. Okay, but I mean, uh, so is it is it a Ricci flow conformal mapping? I don't quite recall. Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. cool. And. Um, is it possible to make a conformal mapping between, say, the uh, cortical surface and the ventricular zone? Um, would that coincide with the path of the radial glia? Um, well, it, it's a little bit hard in the sense that, so conformal mapping is a surface-based technique, right? Not a volume-based technique, right? So- okay. You could conformal map the ventricular zone and you could conformal map the cortical plate or the cortical surface. Um, and you could create some sort of, you, you would then, you, you know, you would, in terms of a visualization technique, I guess you could have a, you know, some sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. But um, I'm not sure exactly what you're thinking of in terms of when you say conformal mapping between the to like so like, are you thinking of like doing some sort of richie flow or some sort of flow yeah that's what i'm thinking i was thinking whether uh, the development of the uh, of the cortex in terms of uh, neurons migrating from the ventricular zone out mm -hmm. to the uh, the cortical plate they can be thought of as a sort of conformal mapping or richie flow or some sort of flow mm -hmm. and if you can identify the parameters of this flow if there's a trajectory is that coincide with the uh, radial glia, then we know something about the underlying dynamics. Yeah, I have to think about that. That's, um, yeah, I have to yeah. think about it. Cool. Uh, and one very final and quick question. So you mentioned at the very beginning uh, uh, that we you're interested in, in computing uh, conformal and topological invariants. And you mentioned uh, a few ways you can compute the conformal invariants. Uh, so 
what type of topological variants do you have in mind? Um, well, I guess because, uh, yeah, I haven't really got anything specific in mind, specifically in terms of topological invariance. I mean, I know there's things like Betty numbers and, and that that perhaps could be of interest. Um, I guess I was, I'm also more thinking of the conformal invariance in terms of the topology of the, the cortex or the different shapes uh, uh -huh. in terms of the, the anatomy. So, but, you know, nothing specific topological i suppose okay yeah i was thinking about something along like i don't know the, the first homotopy group if you mm -hmm. cut out the uh the top of that jar right you have this pattern of pattern of sulci and you can try mm -hmm. to compute the first homotopy group or something but i mean mm -hmm. i only don't know we really spitballing here okay so i'll stop talking otherwise we never leave here so uh people any questions, comments, anything to cross your mind while uh, 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 Monica was talking? Vito has already some ideas, so perhaps everyone else can contribute something as well. I have I, just I, no, go. No, go on. I just want to thank you. I have amazing. one one question. I think you may thought about that question too. When you did the conformal map, it was not not clear to me if you. You got the raw data of a MRI and did uh, the surface. Yes. Uh, yeah. So for the conformal maps, the data, those pictures that I showed did come from MRI data. Um, and so in the uh, ones where we had the Euclidean map, right, what we use as the boundary condition is the distance between um, the um, the actual uh, edge lengths, like the surface mesh of the um, uh, MRI. Um, but in, and so this is something too, where like the um, inverse of distance measures could come be a bigger part is because then you can incorporate more of that geometric information of the, um, the mesh from the MRI data into the actual conformal mapping while while well, keeping the map conformal. Um, because as soon as you try to incorporate, like unless you're using some sort of conformal invariant like inversive distance or something like that, that you can incorporate into the map, you can't just, if you sort of arbitrarily impose different, uh, you know, geometric measures on the conformal map, then you're kind of forcing the, you're, you're not generating a sort of a true conformal map per se, you're, you know, imposing these different weights on it, which would affect the outcome. That would so change I, the angles, right? Right, right. But you see, but to be able to change the angle, to preserve the angles, that's based on the intrinsic information. So, which is obtained sort of from the mesh, right? So if you want to start uh, incorporating, forcing certain geometric features to, to be true, right? Then you're moving into something more like free surfer, where they have a weighting part for the length and the area and, and that. And then so it's not strictly conformal anymore in the definition of conformal, where you're just preserving angles everywhere because you're adding in these extra weighting factors. Right. Cool. Okay. Uh Look, no, I, I won't ask. You know, I have a couple of questions in my mind that would take like a couple of hours to go over to. But I think what we really should think about is how we can like select some of these topics we've mentioned today that we already have in common and have points of contact. And we try to work together and see if we can come up with something we can do jointly or some questions we can try to answer quickly. What do you think? Yeah, I think I that sounds great. But, I mean... <laughs> Claire is looking for a dissertation topic. She's like really starting out fresh. So, you know, she's oh, wow. really to, to devote her time also to sort of working on a on on the project. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know if there's something you sort of want to prioritize and looking at at something or. Well, 
we can think about things and then meet, you know, I'm, this is a good time if you, if, you know, I know you have your lab meeting times around now, but I'm pretty flexible this semester in terms of when I can meet. So if you want to have a sort of regular conference kind of Zoom call, we can do that. Okay, so I jotted down some ideas, uh, both about what we can talk about and when we can talk about. So start with what we can talk about and then Claire, you can perhaps uh, uh, join in and say if there's anything that I mentioned that uh, strikes your fancy and you seem like particularly interested. So one thing that we can try to do something jointly is the cerebellum uh, model. Uh, by cerebellum model, I, I mean the edification of uh, a ribbon in 2D. Okay, so for us, that's an approximate model of the gerification of the cerebellum because the cerebellum folds mostly in one direction. And so if you take this mid sagittal section of the cerebellum, we can have this ribbon and you can try to model this ribbon is much simpler than trying to see how a 3D, uh, a 2D surface folds in 3D. So we have three approaches. We have this model that is much simpler than ones you use, but it's one that is statistical physics in nature, statistical physical in nature. So uh, uh, it incorporates an entropic terms in terms of looking for which configurations, microscopic configurations have the most number of microscopical legal configurations. Uh, and then you have an energy term, which we can modify to incorporate various effects. We have just use some very simple terms here, but that's something that we can change. So that's something I think we can directly interface between your models and ours. Along those lines, and uh, if you think of extending this to a two-dimensional sense, incorporating self-avoidance in two dimensions is extremely hard. Uh, I mean, you said yourself that even in 2D, it's already hard to do that. In two dimensions, it's very hard. But there is this paper that came out recently uh, uh, where they have this very clever way of incorporating self-avoidance in a system. Uh, uh, that essentially it's an extra energy term, but it's not simply an energy term where you have a, a, a penalty for intersection. Uh, it's a penalty for intersection that depends on the intrinsic distance between the points. So it's very, it's very effectively takes something that's self-intersecting and pulls, pulls it apart so it becomes self-avoiding. Uh, so I was thinking if you can perhaps start incorporate those algorithms into, uh, uh, say, your reaction diffusion models or some version of 3D uh, action tension models so that we uh, can get rid of this problem of self-avoidance and see what kind of scaling law we obtain, right? And the third one is by looking at all your models, uh, we have this number of parameters that we have developed some some uh, morphological parameters that we can come up with uh, that we can use to characterize cortical shapes and we have been able to show that cortical shapes in reality they uh, have this very narrow range of some of these parameters right uh, uh, so I like to immediately see whether the scaling law that you obtain from your various modeling also obeys these scaling laws that we observe in actual courses and in our theoretical models as well so these are like the three main areas I think we can collaborate, okay? Mm -hmm. And just to quickly finish where we can do this, uh, I was going to ask you, are you going to be in SFN this year? Because I will. So we can meet in San Diego if you're there. Um, when is, I hadn't, I don't have plans to, but I could perhaps, because I have, uh, when is that conference? It's in November. I'll just check when. So it's November 12th to 16th. Okay, in San Diego. Um, yeah. Okay, Society for Neuroscience? Yeah. Is that one? Yeah. Um, okay, I will look. There, there will actually be somebody, I, sometimes some people from FSU, from our psychology department, go there. Um, so but I'll look and see if I can... Uh, go there, but I would also very much be interested if you're if you're going to be there if um, if it doesn't work out or if you'd like to give I don't know if you're going to be in the U.S. Um, next in the spring, but have you come out too to FSU? You could come and give a talk, you know. So if you're somewhere, then I could have you could pay from wherever else you're coming from. 
or uh, actually I should. I mean, I have this collaboration in Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, which is not too far. No, uh, uh, and uh, I was meaning to go over there either this December or early next year. Uh -huh. So I don't know uh, what dates it work for you. Um, you said spring, right? But I mean, I, I'm more fl I'm yeah, flexible. Yeah, well, January for four, January spring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um uh yeah well let me take a look at the calendar and and sort of see um you uh -huh. know what, what might work um so and i would also be very interested in you know or if it works out better to come visit you too that That'd would be, be great yeah. yeah yeah so i i also have some travel funds that i can use uh for that um oh it would be generally wonderful to welcome you here Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so our situation is this: we are uh, we are mostly virtual lab right now because I'm mm -hmm. a theoretical physicist. I never thought I would have an experimental lab, uh -huh. but then I got this funding, which enabled me to get this group, and then that uh, forced me to consider having an actual lab. We have this project of collecting cetacean brains and scanning them on MRI, which the people involved with that is not here, fortunately. But we have this really big collection. We have about, I think, 50 brains of cetaceans that we have scanned. So mm -hmm. uh, we got the funding for the for the, the lab. We got the money. Uh, we got the people who are going to build it. What we don't have is a sane bureaucracy in my university. So that's stuck in this bureaucratic limbo. So what I would suggest is, I mean, hopefully that's going to get unstuck throughout the later part of this mm -hmm. year is that you might want to come to us when we have the lab ready so we can have this really nice place and nice environment we can collaborate but having said that any time after that presumably by the beginning of next year would be great time for you to come you just have to yeah. tell me what dates work for you and of yeah. course that extends to you as well claire I'll be, I'll be very happy to host both of you Ooh. yeah yeah that that sounds great so yeah um uh, you know, I can send you some dates, certainly. So I don't know when you're thinking this will get up and running, but certainly anything May onwards makes it easier for an extended visit because our semester ends at the end of April. Oh, um, cool. That, so that yeah. actually look, looks pretty well for me because yeah. uh, I, I usually travel to Europe uh, in the July, August framework, mm -hmm. but May and June are perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'll do, uh, it, it's going to be sort of winterish here which is a good thing because it's not too hot <laughs> uh, uh, and it's not too busy either the, the yeah. tourism mostly comes in december and during carnival so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. may is so, not so winter yeah <laughs> yeah, not, not, yeah. Not too much. no but the thing is it's it, 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 it's better than uh say march late march because yes. it rains and yeah. uh, Rio is a miserable place when it's rainy. It's a beautiful yeah. one when it's not. So we really think you should come here when it's not rainy. Yeah. 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 I can take yeah, you so to dive here in, in Rio. Yeah. Right. And I'm a good... I can take you to dive here in Rio. Oh, that Rio. would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, one thing that I, 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 I I'm going to cook for you. Uh, I, I have these habits of cooking for my students. So when one of them defends or during the end of the year, we have this yeah. massive dinner at my place. So it would yeah. be my pleasure to host all of you. And then we're going to cook for you. And then we can have a proper dinner because I can't pay them well, but I can feed them. So that's my philosophy. <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> cool, cool. So, yeah, that sounds like a plan. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all, all of these projects sound sound right. interesting. Yeah, I think they're they're all great starting points. Um, I think probably the the self avoidance is probably the hardest. Well, I don't know. They might all be hard, but <laughs> the self avoidance yeah. will be the, the hardest one. Um, uh -huh. I think perhaps the the third one um, is sort of a good perhaps starting point because we could compare. Um, cause you had mentioned, right. Looking at your models where you have this sort of universal scaling, um, right. and seeing how some of the results that we have, uh, if they fit into that model or compare, or if we could generate similar sort of data that would art for the parameters in your model. And mm -hmm. I think that that would be a good starting point perhaps. 
uh, just for Claire to get familiar with some of the different models okay. and software. But I think all of them are um, uh, really, really great. Um, the so third one, I think it's one of the most interesting for my job in Vitor right now because I have I have read uh, Sarah King's mm -hmm. uh, thesis again yep. today, and she applied it to microcephaly. Yeah. And we yeah. have been working with some data of microcephaly, so maybe it could we could understand a little bit more of our our variables by knowing what your model tells. Yep. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, I think that would be really good. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so just, uh, uh, Bruno, você pode ligar sua câmera? Can you can you turn on your camera? Yeah, yeah. She's a little bit uh, bad, but no, it's okay. As long as you are decent, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Bruno is my master's student. He just finished his uh, undergrad thesis, and it, it essentially involves creating and then testing uh, uh, this cerebellar folding on uh, uh, on uh, um, on this computer model. Uh, so that's one place we can try to get this scaling loss. So it's a good thing that the three of them are here because these are the three people I think we're going to be interfacing the most. Mm -hmm. uh, Fernando and Vito, you already know. I wanted you to, to meet Bruno because that's, Hi. I think, going to be part of his little, master thesis. A little bit off. I have to buy new ones. It's okay. Yeah, it look, makes you look like brooding and mysterious. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so that's what I suggest. Why don't we reconvene again and say, next month or so and i can perhaps prepare a quick presentation uh, it's not going to be a to the force like yours it's not uh, going to be a, a, a story but i mean just a quick presentations of these parameters we have developed and how we can test them how the data looks for both the theoretical and the experimental point of view uh, so we can then perhaps talk about how we can try to test them in your modeling sounds great yeah yeah cool. so, that would be good so we are now in, yikes, mid to late September, which is scary by in itself. Uh, so why do you think about say early October? Uh, say, let me think, uh, I'll be, uh, yeah, so what does the week of say, um, 16 to 22 of October look for you? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I any, mean, let's see. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's pretty clear for me. This is a good, so I'm not actually teaching this semester, so I'm pretty clear for oh, a lot of days this semester. Um, next semester I'll be teaching again, but, um, uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, uh -huh. any, any day that week right now, um, it looks, looks to be like a great day. So we could do Monday again, if you want, like at this time, like at, at uh, uh -huh. your three o'clock, if that's good for you, or if you want to uh -huh. suggest a different date uh -huh. or time. Uh -huh. Just look at my calendar. Uh, so, let me see. So Monday would be the... 17. 17. Uh, let me take Mariana. Oh, no. Uh, I'm going to have a guest here. We're going to talk about a model about one dimensional water. Mm -hmm. uh, would the transit work for you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can make this, I mean, it can be this time, it can be earlier, but it, no, it's probably, yeah, because I teach. So, yeah, it'll be too early for you. Uh, so, do you think you can make this the same time on the yep. 20th? Uh, yep, sure. 3 p.m. GMT. Uh-huh. Cool, cool. So, I'll have a presentation prepared, and then you can try to find these points of interface, and then we can move on from there. Okay. Um, sounds good. If you could send maybe some, uh, so you would mentioned like a, a paper um, uh, about uh, from item one uh, with the, the statistical physics or the cerebellum, um, the, um, I don't know, you mentioned a paper I didn't write down. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, yeah, I have a bunch of them that I'm going to send to you. So uh, there's <laughs> one paper about the, um, so there's our papers. I don't know if you're familiar with them about course gentrification. Uh, I looked at one or two. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a couple of new ones that, um, well, I can say they're preprint. That's one about the fractality of the cortex. Mm -hmm. But the, the other paper I'm going to send you is about the role of astrocytes in course gentrification. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, I think, a, a new one that's important. Uh, and then also, if you can, please have a look at whether you can be, uh, also what dates are good for you for me to go over to mm -hmm. Florida and whether you can make it to San Diego mm -hmm. and then we can coordinate from there. Yep, sounds good. Cool. Yeah, that sounds really promising. Excellent, I'm very excited. Me too. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I guess I'm going to fin uh, I'm gonna end the recording here. And if I should have done that yeah, soon. And, anyway. and if any of you have any 